our gospel lesson today comes to us from Matthew chapter 16, found on page 22 of the New Testament, beginning at verse 13. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others uh, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Jesus said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth you will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven." Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone he was the Messiah. The Gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. You may have noticed a few moments ago that we skipped over the glory of God in the bulletin, if you were looking at your bulletin thoroughly. That's because I learned something this week. You've never sung that before. And although it's lovely, it's a little hard. So we thought we might wait until the band or the choir is here to help lead us in that. This is only another one of my learnings about Trinity. When you go to seminary to become a pastor, you learn that in the beginning of your ministry at a place is not the time to try new things. Why? because I don't know you, because we don't have the trust equity between us, because a song might really fail and we all might not feel very good about that. It's good for me to learn about you. In the beginning is the time for me to listen and learn. I hear a lot of stories from you about things that have happened in the past, a lot of, well, we used to, and then fill in the blank. And that is not necessarily a bad thing. Please don't hear it as a negative, unless, of course, we can't eventually move on together. But it helps me not only understand Trinity, but also get to know you. And of course, there are still surprises that I encounter all the time. My favorite so far that I've learned was on Easter morning when Pastor Brian told me, Oh, yeah, and sometimes on Easter, there's a bird in the sanctuary. <laughs> oh, okay, great. Surprise. The point is, it's good for me to know the history of this place. But as they say, if you do not learn history, you are doomed to repeat it. Or in Pharaoh's case, just doomed. Pharaoh, I'm afraid, must have been willfully negligent in learning he was born to be a ruler of Egypt and surely had the advantages of an Egyptian education. Certainly he had advisors willing to tell him the history of his nation, but the Bible tells us he didn't know Joseph. Joseph, the foreign slave, remember him, who came and saved the entire nation of Egypt during a famine? This clever, inventive, loyal immigrant became a powerful and respected man in the whole nation. Joseph is a name that must have been known to many, but not Pharaoh. No, Pharaoh neglects his history and instead performs a political trick on his people, one often repeated today. Pharaoh stirs up fear to gain more power. He paints the descendants of Joseph as power-hungry dangers to security and prosperity to the rightful residents of Egypt. Pharaoh trades on exaggeration. They are stronger than we are. They're not real true Egyptians. They'll join the enemy. 
In the end, Pharaoh moves against the Hebrew people through slavery, abuse, and ethnic cleansing. This is no joke of a story. And sadly, it isn't the last one of its kind, is it? Hitler did this, right? In very simple terms. I'm making it very simple, I know. He played on fears and divided Germany into us versus them. This is part of the history of India and Pakistan. What was once one nation deliberately divided on Great Britain's withdrawal so that religions could be separated into us and them. And of course, we have the example of President Andrew Johnson, who neglected, uh, neglected planned reconstruction after the Civil War, allowing unjust hierarchy to remain. This power structure saw the invention of black codes, Jim Crow laws, home ownership covenants that would not allow black people to own homes in neighborhoods so that segregation became just the way things are. And because we have not learned the history of race and power in our own nation, a space is left open where artifacts of oppression can be newly adopted by hate groups, and it only heightens us versus them. Us versus them is an incredibly powerful political tool, but it is not the tool of Jesus Christ. As Christians, <laughs> we will not fall victim to this ploy. We, as Christians, know our history, that God made us, loves us, died for us. We know the beauty, compassion, forgiveness of the love of God. And we will not let an us-versus-them mindset live inside ourselves. And there are so many, so many divisions out there. But you can't trick us. You can't trick us because we know who Jesus is. And it's time for us to stand up and say it. The love of God for all of creation in Jesus Christ is not limited by fear or oppression or hatred or a Pharaoh-like political trick. No! Jesus Christ is the Messiah for all. Jesus Christ is absolutely for those who are left behind in the rural spots on the Rust Belt. Jesus Christ is absolutely for those who are trapped in the wild west of urban ghettos trying to survive. Jesus Christ loves people who fall into traditional marriage categories. Jesus Christ loves people who are gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender. Jesus Christ loves white people. Jesus Christ loves black people. People. And in Jesus Christ, it is not a contradiction to love both groups, and the least we can do is say so. Have you seen this protest sign lately? It says, equal rights for others does not mean fewer rights for you. It's not pie. I love it because I love pie, and it's kind of funny. Equal rights for others does not mean fewer rights for you. It's not pie. I hope we Christians know that the same is also true for grace. It's not pie. The inclusive grace of God, the amazing love of Jesus Christ, is for all people. And since we know our history, since we know who Jesus is, our silence must end. We must speak out for the equality that we have also received. The equality of grace gives us the freedom, the power, the obligation to speak out against hatred here and now. Yes, right here and right now. It cannot wait. 
Did you notice in our gospel today, Peter proclaims the living God? I've been trying to repeat that theme this morning. Living as in here and now. Maybe with the mentions of Hades and the kingdom of heaven in the gospel, maybe you thought that Jesus and his disciples were doing some planning for the future, for later, for the great beyond. But we are wrong if that's what we think. We are plain wrong if our faith is merely an eternal life insurance policy. The kingdom of heaven is happening now under the reign of our living God. And Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God, Jesus Christ is the one who brings that kingdom to us, to all of us. Those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. So remember, kids, Pharaoh, Pharaoh, right? is all about stirring up fear for the sake of his power. But Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is all about taking away fear for the sake of God's true power. In light of our world today, the political tenor of our nation, I feel like I've got to ask who do you say Jesus is? I mean, do you know? In the midst of all these us versus them and them versus us, can you remember what you've learned? Jesus, the Son of the living God, is nothing, nothing like fear. Nothing like oppression, nothing like us versus them, nothing like Pharaoh. This is good news. Praise be to God. Now I invite.